Uh, welcome to Mangalam Center. I'm so happy to see everyone here today. My name is Morgan. I'm Associate Director here at Mangalam Center. And our guest here today is Daniel Weidlinger. He is a professor of Asian religions at California State University, Chico. And he is a expert or a pioneer in the field of Buddhism and the digital media. Uh, professor Weidlinger uh, received his doctorate at University of Chicago, where he uh, studied South Asian languages and civilizations. His first book was called Spreading the Dhamma. And, uh, had to do with, with Buddhism in Thailand, I believe. That's right. right. And, uh, <clears throat> and his second book is uh, the one we are featuring today called From Indra's Net to Internet, Communication Technology and the Evolution of Buddhist Ideas. Those books are on sale today uh, at a discounted price of $40 if you're interested in purchasing one at the end of the talk. And we're Happy to have you here, so I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, this is a really lovely environment to give a talk in, just a beautiful room. I'll stand, if that's okay. I'm used to teaching you know, my big classes at Chico, so uh, I'm more comfortable standing when I talk. Yes, good, and my head is not high, so high that it's interfering with the slides. So. As you know, we are living in the internet age. We see the internet permeating all sorts of things that we do. And the internet has a strong connection to all of the religions of the world. In fact, some of the very first projects that were done on the internet had to do with various <coughs> religious organizations setting up their websites. And even the first computing uh, projects that were done at all often had to do with religion. In fact, one of the first digital humanities projects ever was setting up a concordance of the works of St. Thomas Aquinas. That was one of the first things in the 50s that was done uh, with computers and the study of the humanities. So there's been a long history of the relationship between religions and digital media since day one. And of course, there's been... Um, a uh, long history of Buddhism with media of any form since day one. Uh, some of you might know that the very first examples of writing in India were uh, written by, or on, not by, but on the orders of the great Buddhist king Ashoka in the middle of the third century BC. And the first written documents pretty much across the board uh, in India were Buddhist documents. And uh, then moving into China, you might know that in the ninth century, the development of the printing press uh, was also done by Buddhist monks with the express purpose of spreading the Dharma, spreading the teachings of the Buddha more effectively, because how better can you do it than by printing books? So Buddhism has been intimately uh, associated with the development of different media uh, from writing to printing, and then to the internet across uh, the world. And many of you also probably know that some of the great uh, forerunners of the digital world we live in today, for example, uh, Steve Jobs, he considered himself a Buddhist. And um, Douglas Engelbart, who invented the mouse, he was very into meditation. In fact, he, had, he made sure that everybody on his team at the Stanford Research Institute and Bell Labs, where he was working, uh, he made sure that they would go to meditation sessions as well. So these things have been closely tied to Buddhism since uh, day one. And nowadays, you can find, of course, Buddhist apps on your iPhone. There's hundreds of different apps teaching you when to meditate, and you've got daily Dharma readings and all of these kinds of things. So Buddhism has been very good at, um, at integrating itself into the, uh, the Internet and digital life in general. You also have whole organizations dedicated to the study of Buddhism and digital media. So one of the uh, more well-known ones that I highly recommend people check out is called Buddhist Geeks. And they're an organization dedicated to thinking about Buddhism and technology. And they have an annual conference on this subject in which very uh, interesting things are discussed. So what I want to talk about tonight is a specific affinity that Buddhism has for the internet and digital media. 
because I think that there is definitely something going on here, some sort of connection between Buddhism particularly and the digital world that we are living in nowadays. So, for example, uh, I started this research about 10 years ago, so 2008. It took me, you know, about eight years to write the book. Uh, so when I was started off, one of the big social networking sites was MySpace. So I did a lot of my original research on that. Now, this is a really interesting phenomenon. So the Pew Institute is a large social research institute that conducts many surveys about American life, and they do a lot about religion. So their largest survey in 2008 came up with uh, a religious breakdown of America. You might know that the census does not actually ask for your religion because there's supposed to be a separation of church and state. So to get um, good data on the religious breakdown of America, you have to go to other sites, uh, other sources besides the census. So the Pew uh, Institute is an institute that does this. So they looked at the religious breakdown of America and they looked at how many Catholics there are uh, other Christians, Jews, Muslims, etc. Now, if you look at MySpace it, back then in 2008, it also had uh, details of how many users put in their profiles what their religion is. And it's amazing that the breakdown was almost exactly the same as the Pew breakdown. So the same percentage of MySpace users uh, who said they were Catholic were, uh, it was the same number that you found on the Pew. So this, in this chart, a number one indicates that it's the same in the Pew General Survey of America as it is on MySpace. Notice, Buddhists are far more represented on MySpace than they were in the general American population. So when I saw this, I started thinking that maybe people who tend to be online... Now, of course, this again was 10 years ago, uh, when you know, not everybody was spending all their time online. Nowadays, things have changed in that basically everybody spends all their time online. So you can't really divide out the population anymore between like internet users and non-internet users. But back then, you could still think in terms of internet users that was a different group than regular Americans. So uh, we saw that internet users are far more uh, interested in boot or uh, claim that they are Buddhist far more than the regular American population. Then if you look at dating sites, dating sites are a good way to look at uh, people's religious ideas because of course that's an important feature of, of dating, right? People want to make sure that, or often people like to look for somebody when they date. Uh, who has a similar religion to they do. That's why I'm Jewish and I married a Muslim. But <laughs> anyway, um, so this here represents uh, the amount of interest in the religion and the amount of adherence of the religion. So on the various dating sites that we looked at, people say, what is their religion? But then they also say, what are my interests? You know, so they'll say, I'm interested in skiing and romantic walks on the beach and Buddhism, right? And... Uh, <clears throat> the proportion of people who said they were interested in Buddhism far outweighs the amount of people who were Buddhist. Whereas the proportion of people who said, I'm interested in Christianity or Jesus or whatever, was still higher than Buddhist, let's be clear. But compared to the amount of Christians, right, so this is trying to normalize it, uh, compared to the amount of Christians, it was much, much less uh, proportionally than the amount of people who said they were interested in Buddhism or Buddhist meditation or something like that. So again, we see that in these online sites, there seems to be a strong interest in Buddhism. Once again, there's a virtual reality system called Second Life, which basically mimics the regular world, but it's all computerized. It's one of the first immersive virtual reality systems, and they have groups uh, where pe the people join, and they go to, in fact, centers that look just like this. I mean, they're digital versions, but you know your character that's called an avatar, right? And of course, that's not specifically from Buddhism, but uh, uh, an Indian idea, an avatar is your character in the video game, goes to a temple that is built to look just like a Buddhist temple, and they can uh, meditate there or listen to a Dharma talk or whatever. And interestingly enough, if you see in 2010, there were 2,100 members of the Buddha Center, 1,500 of Second Life Christians, and 712 of the Uma of Nur. So these are the three biggest organizations for their respective religions. There are many other organizations. I'm not saying these are the only ones, but of the you know, 20 or 30 different Buddhist groups, the one called Buddha Center is the biggest, and the one called Second Life Christians is the biggest, is uh, the biggest Christian group. And you will see that there are more members of the Buddha group 
than the Christian group amongst American users, even though there are you know, far more Christians in America than Buddhists. Not only is it the biggest group, but it also grew at the fastest rate. So you will see that over six years, the Second Life grew as Christian groups stayed the same, but the Buddhism group grew by 162%. So again, it suggests that maybe there is something about being online or using the internet or engaging in digital media, media that somehow uh, makes people attracted to Buddhist ideas or gets people interested in Buddhism more than they might be in other religions. So that was the initial question that I had in my mind when I began to research this book. And then I, as I thought more about it, I realized that this is nothing new. Because what makes the internet the internet? It's a system that connects people and connects ideas very thoroughly. So the internet is something that allows us to hear about ideas from China or from uh, Russia or India within a split second. And it's, um, it's a gathering place for all sorts of different people. Uh, many of you might have friends on social networks that you've never actually met, but they are friends that you have some common interest with and they might be living in you know, Pakistan or in South Africa or in Germany or wherever it might be, and you talk to them about things that before the internet would have been much more difficult to talk to them about. Now, if we look at some of the places where Buddhism has flourished in the past, so uh, of the various religions that were found along the Silk Road, for example, in the medieval world, Buddhism was the most popular one. And the Silk Road um, was the internet of its day, right? It was the place where you had market towns like Khotan and Kashgar, where people would gather from all over the world, they would speak many different languages, and they would have market towns where people would discuss various religious ideas. And of the various religions, including um, Christian, Nestorian Christianity and um, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism was the one that flourished the most in this environment. So I began to think, and people often call the internet the electronic Silk Road, and I began to wonder if it's not just a coincidence that Buddhism flourished along the Silk Road in the same way that it's flourishing on the internet today. So what I do in the book is I look at some key features of Buddhism and try to think about why those features might um, do well in societies that have robust communication between different people from different places, doing different things, and talking about stuff in interesting ways. So, there are many features of Buddhism, and obviously this is controversial, right? There's many things, many aspects of Buddhism that people feel are core ideas of Buddhism. However, for the purposes of this study, and that's what academics do, right? We divide things up into little groups of stuff and we say, these are the five points of this and the seven points of that. In fact, as you know, that's what Buddhists do as well, right? There are the eight noble truths and what, uh, sorry, no, it wasn't eight. I think it's four noble <laughs> There are four noble truths in the eightfold path. Anyway, so I like to think of these key features as some of the things that make Buddhism what it is. Now, that does not mean, by the way, that other religions don't have some of these features. But what it does mean is that of all the various world religions, Buddhism incorporates these features the most strongly. So let's look at them one by one. So there's interdependence, the idea of pratitya samutpada, that things are all connected in deep ways and all affecting each other. There's the idea of impermanence. There's the idea of no soul, anatman, right, that we do not have a permanent, unchanging soul. There is a reduced emphasis on tradition, right? So as you might know, in uh, 5th or 6th century BC, India, when the Buddha started his religion, a lot of the discourses that he gave were to tell people that the various rituals that they were doing, the various sacrifices, don't really have any effect, that you've got to purify your actions instead of using rituals. And since that day until now, Buddhism has had less of an emphasis on ritual. Again, of course, ritual is a big part of Buddhist practice, but compared to many other religions, ritual has a secondary position in Buddhism. And then there's also the idea of a universal moral code, that Buddhism is actually the first universal religion. 
right? In ancient times, uh, you had Judaism, you had uh, various you know, precursors of Hinduism, you had Zoroastrianism, but all of those religions were really confined to specific groups, right? So in India, there were different groups that were Hindus. They were not proselytizing. Uh, the same thing with Judaism, the same thing with uh, uh, Zoroastrianism to an extent. Buddhism was really the first religion that saw itself as a religion that should be spread to all the four corners of the globe. And the Buddha explicitly told the monks that they should go and spread his teachings around the world to all and sundry in their own languages. Um, then you have compassion for all beings. Right? So of course, most of the great ancient religions talk about the importance of compassion, but it's a graded compassion. Right? So Confucianism is a case in point, where Confucian said, yes, love everybody, but love your family the most, then your nation, and then other people. So it was a graded compassion. And many religions really didn't talk about compassion for others at all. They just focused on compassion for your own religious group. But Buddhism said, we have to have compassion for all beings. Buddhism also talks about individual moral responsibility. So uh, if we compare it to another ancient religion, let's say Judaism, they talk about Am Yisrael, right, which is the, um, the nation of Israel, and it acts as one, and God kind of is angry at the Am Yisrael, you know, at the nation, rather than specific individuals doing this or that. Uh, so many people in the ancient world lived in communitarian, uh, a communitarian way of life, where they didn't really think of themselves as individuals responsible for their own moral behavior, but rather the group either finds favor from the gods or not. But Buddhism focused a lot on the individual, and also has a reconfiguration of ritual, which kind of goes along with the reduced emphasis on received traditions, rather than experiencing things for yourself, right? So when people said to the Buddha, uh, how do I know that what you're saying is true? The Buddha didn't say it's because a long line of tradition has said it's true, so you have to believe it, as I'm sure people here uh, know who've come to the Center for Meditation and whatnot. Uh, the Buddha said you have to experience it for yourself, right? So don't believe me just because I say it, but experience it for yourself. So I think that, I, I hope that most of us can agree that these are some of the key elements of Buddhism. So if we go through them, we can see, let's go through them one by one. So interdependence. Living in a robust network of communications is likely to instill an appreciation for the ways that we are all connected. So if you think about the internet, it does a number of things well, but one of the things it does best is connect people allow us to see that we are connected to these people. And of course, one of the main ways that people use the internet is through social media. And that is all about showing manifestly how we are all connected to each other. So then you come across a religion that talks about the idea of us all being connected to each other through patitya samupada, right? It's through cause and effect, that one thing affects something else and that thing in turn affects another thing and creates a web. And in fact, the title of my book from Indra's net to internet, derives from a Buddhist legend found in the Avatamsaka Sutra that talks about um, the idea that Indra is one of the classical Indian gods. And they say that the whole world is like a net made by Indra. But in that net, there are diamonds each time the... Uh, each time the um, the strings cross. At each cross place, there's a diamond. And you can see reflected in that, in that diamond all the other diamonds in the net, right? So everything is reflected in everything else. That's this image of Indra's net, a giant net that the whole universe is resting in. And it's all connected and interdependent, and ref each part reflects the other part. So you have a religion that said that thousands of years ago, and then if you're using the internet and you come across those ideas, presumably they might resonate more with somebody in that environment than they would if you were living in a small isolated village in pre-modern times without any communication with the outside world. The idea of interconnection might not appeal to you as much. You would think, well, why would I care what's going on in China or in 
uh, Africa or other places that I've never been to. They're just not part of your world, and you don't have a sense that we are interconnected with the people and events that are going on in those places. But Buddhism has talked about those ideas for, uh, since the beginning. They are more emphasized in the Mahayana forms of Buddhism than the Theravada forms, but nevertheless, they are certainly still a big part of the Theravada forms of the religion. So I think that the internet helps to instill this idea of interdependence more deeply inside the users than other uh, forms of communication. So that's uh, the first one. Now let's look at impermanence. So the internet is also nothing if not impermanent, right? You go to a website and it says one thing, and then you go the next day and it says something else. And it seems really real, right? When you're reading something or you're watching something on the internet, it really feels real. And you almost forget that it's simply just the random flashings of the, uh, of the pixels in your screen, right? There's nothing actually there. And when Buddhism comes along and says, by the way, welcome to life, everybody, there's also nothing actually there. It seems like it is, but it's all changing and moving and impermanent. Again, that kind of idea is going to appeal to somebody who spends hours and hours staring at the flickering screen more than it might appeal to somebody who doesn't do that, right? Um, and this is a post from a Buddhism Second Life forum. Sometimes uh, people on the internet say things a lot better than uh, anybody else could. So he said, Second Life is the ultimate in impermanence. It's electronic bits and bytes held on a server at Linden Labs that come and go. And yet, the emotions of the people connected are real, the interaction is real, and the connections made can change lives. It all comes back to the perceptions within each of us. And aren't they just impermanent chemicals and firing neurons? Right? So this is somebody who actually, through his use of the virtual reality of Second Life, you know, staring at the screen and having his character move around and do things and you know, pray at uh, uh, meditate at Buddhist centers and then maybe go skiing or whatever he does, uh, it helped him to realize the impermanence and changeability and you know, sort of immaterial aspect of life in general. So that's another good example of, uh, of this. Okay, another key aspect of Buddhism, right? Anatman, maybe the single most important factor. Um, on the internet, we can have multiple online identities. So imagine Buddhism comes along and says, I know you think that you are this one permanent being, but really there is no true you, no unchanging core that makes you you. But you are just a complicated amalgamation of different uh, aggregates, right, skandhas, different parts, different emotions, different feelings, they're all moving and changing all the time. And you say, ah, I don't really agree with that. But then you go online and you are, let's say, Dharma Daniel on Second Life, uh, but then you are, um, uh, then you are, well, let's say you can be Daniel Weidlinger on your uh, CSU Chico account, and then you can be somebody completely different on another account. You can be, uh, let's say, a dog, right? You know that famous joke on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Um, so you can pretend, you know, in fact, there's many people on Second Life who incarnate as animals. They just, you know, have always wanted to be a dog and they go in as a dog and they just enjoy playing like that. Um, so anyway, and you can be a, a woman if you're a man or a man if you're a woman or whatever identity you want. And you can use different language and talk different ways. And I'm sure if you think about it, you all probably have accounts on different internet sites where you're a slightly different version of yourself. So doing this can make somebody realize that you know, maybe the Buddha was onto something, right? Maybe there really isn't one solid fixed self, but there are indeed many different aspects to me. And they can change and move from one, uh, one uh, position to another in terms of who I am. So I think that definitely this idea of having multiple identities online can help to question the idea that we have one permanent self, which is one of the key teachings of Buddhism. Now we also have deep immersion in online experiences. And immersion is the state of consciousness where an immersion's awareness 
of physical self is diminished or lost by being surrounded in an engrossing total environment. So uh, we often experience immersion when we go to a movie, for example, right? You sit down in the theater, the lights go down, and then as the movie goes on, you kind of forget that you're even there watching it, right? And you just uh, become part of the movie. So that's an immersive experience. And we have that experience a lot when we're on the internet, looking, you know, uh, surfing from one site to another, and you just kind of forget about the body and just become part of it. And what that can do is um, make you uh, get confused about what you are, what the screen is, where you are. So it helps to, again, problematize, problematize the idea of I am me and the screen is the screen and you are you. And it makes you realize that maybe the individual ego is much more malleable than one might have thought. And again, this is a posting from a MySpace Buddhism group by a guy called Diesel. And he said, from using the internet a lot, he says, gradually the ego begins to weaken, and in time it dissolves completely, as does the sense of I, me, and mine. No sense of self or ownership. That is how I feel when I am online for hours. So here you have this uh, young gentleman talking about how he feels when he's online and noticing that it tends to agree with some of the teachings that he's learned about in Buddhism. Uh, in terms of the nature of the self, where he ends and somebody else begins. So these are all Buddhist ideas that are really instantiated by using the internet. Then we have a universal moral code. As the internet spreads its wires throughout the globe like a universal nervous system, it brings all of humanity together. People are expected, therefore, to behave in similar ways and follow a similar code. For example, there's a universal declaration of human rights, no matter where they are. So we have to remember that in the pre-modern world, uh, different countries had different moral codes and were expected to have different moral codes. So again, for example, uh, in ancient Judaism, you had the Jewish laws, so Jews weren't allowed to uh, eat pork, for example. But what many people actually don't realize is that that says nothing about what non-Jews are supposed to do. Like sometimes, uh, you know, I might have some Jewish friends and then some non-Jewish friends, and the non-Jewish person might say, oh, I've got a ham sandwich, do you mind if I eat it? And in fact, in theory, the Jewish person is not supposed to care one way or the other, because uh, the Jewish code of not eating pork is not meant to be followed by non-Jews, right? So, and the ancient world was like this, in most cases, right? The different groups had their own laws and they didn't even expect other people to follow those laws. So like it just, the laws weren't meant for them. But Buddhism is not like that. In Buddhism there is a universal moral code and everybody is expected to follow these ideas. And that is what we are seeing in the modern wired world as well, right? Where there is the idea that there are universal codes that are applicable to everybody. So that's another way in which Buddhism meshes well with the internet era. And then, of course, we have compassion for all beings. So here you have a little image of somebody talking with a bunch of friends, and you can see they're all from different races and cultures. And uh, we learn about other people by talking with them in social media, people from all over the world. And what that does is it brings their well-being into our consciousness and not just the well-being of our own tribe. So, for, so to have compassion for all beings, you first have to have some idea of what all beings are. So if you're living, again, in the pre-modern world, in an isolated village somewhere, right, the idea of compassion for all beings outside of your tribe, it wouldn't really resonate with you one way or the other, because you've never met somebody who's not from your tribe. Right? We have to remember that in the pre-modern world, most people never met somebody they didn't know. I mean, it's kind of hard to think about it, but you have to remember that most people in the medieval world, you know, in small villages in Europe, never really left a village and might never have met anybody who's not from there. So whether they agree with compassion for all or not, it's not even like there's anything for them to agree to because they've never really thought about caring about somebody in China or whatever. It was just some place that may as well not have existed. However, imagine if you're having business meetings with your team, some of whom are in Kuala Lumpur and some of whom are in um, you know, Delhi and some of whom are in uh, Florianopolis, 
in Brazil, right? And this is your team that you're working with and you're Skyping with them all the time and seeing them and talking to them. Then when you hear that there's an earthquake in Florianopolis, you actually care about what happens to the people there. I mean, just think about this for a minute. In the pre-internet world, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, when there was a war, the government would lie and say, oh, we killed this many of the enemy. And then people would go research and say, oh, that was a lie. They really only killed a thousand, but they're saying they killed a million. Nah, that didn't happen. Nowadays, the government's like, oh, we only killed 50 people in this bombing attack. And then a re uh, journalist goes and says, no, we actually killed a thousand of the enemy. And everybody in our country gets outraged at this, right? So just think about the difference that governments used to lie, have to lie, if they want to stay in power, about how many of the enemy they killed when they actually killed less. Now they lie about how many they didn't kill when they actually killed more, right? Because compassion for the other is uh, an ethos that is spreading through society, and I'm sure that communications media has something to do with that. Because if you're playing an online game of chess with somebody in Iraq, and then they say, oh, I've got to stop playing, we're being bombed, you suddenly care about what's happening to that person in Iraq in a way that you wouldn't have done before the internet. And again, Buddhism was one of the first religions to articulate these kinds of ideas. Then you have individual moral responsibility. Um, this, is a, this gets a little complicated because I'm good. Uh, we don't really have time to get into this, but um, silent, re well, to have individual moral responsibility, you have to have the idea of the individual, right? Now, I know I just said that the internet helps break down the idea of the individual, but to break down the idea, you've got to have the idea of the individual as well. So it both breaks down the idea of the individual, but also creates a sense of the individual, uh, as all communication media has done. So the more communication we have often, the more of a sense of individuation there is. So uh, one of the great works in the history of media studies is called The Printing Press as an Agent of Change by Elizabeth Eisenstein. She talked a lot about how the modern subject is connected to the emergence of private reading. So reading a novel on your own, hearing that inner voice, makes you think about yourself as an individual. You're not somebody in a crowd listening to a priest preached at you. You are reading individually. Uh, and of course, the internet involves a lot of private reading, and this drives the sense of individuality further in some ways, although again, in other ways, it breaks it down. But the point is, um, it does help uh, moral responsibility to grow, because if you don't think of yourself as in some way an individual person, you're not going to think you're individually morally responsible. Although again, in other ways, the internet can also help break down the sense of the individual. And finally, there's a loosening of ritual and tradition. So the ability to learn so much and so easily about so many other cultures and ways of life weakens the hold of traditional rituals. We can easily see that other people are doing just fine without worshipping in exactly the way we do. Right? So one of the ways that ritual has had, like traditions and rituals have had such a strong grip on people in, uh, in uh, human history is that everybody in the society did those rituals and people saw that, you know, the, people saw that that's how you live and they figured I better do these rituals the more exposure one has to other people doing other rituals and living in other ways, the more you're likely to question your own ways, because you were told that you could never possibly have a successful society unless they performed these rituals, and if you only lived in that society and there was no telephone or radio or television, so that's all you knew, you figure, well, I guess they must be right, because I've heard tales of other societies that have collapsed, but you've never really seen them. But when you have the internet and television and modern media in general, you learn about what's going on in other countries and you see that they're doing rituals and they're doing just fine. So it obviously is going to make somebody question their traditional ways of doing things a little more strongly. And that's something that, again, the Buddha was one of the first people to, uh, to think about. So the big question that I want to leave you with is, is it possible that the internet and related computer-mediated communication can lead to a questioning of subjective identity and a greater appreciation of the interconnected world and its current needs that transcend the individual ego in ways that Buddhism has been trying to do for thousands of years. And I think that the evidence is that it might very well be happening. So I think that'll end my opening remarks and then we can 
have uh, some questions. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Uh, I think one of the most compelling things for me about your particular area of study is how much I, uh, you know, think of my own experience as as you're talking and like, oh, is that the way I think when I'm, you know, interacting on social media, or is that uh, what I'm, you know, is that the way I'm, I'm presenting myself on different sites or are those different identities. So it really kind of gets the kind of thought process going. So right. I think it's a very interesting uh, field of study that you've, you've chosen. One thing that stuck out to me was, um, you know, your list of uh, kind of like the Buddhist ideas that mm -hmm. are starting to uh, thrive and, and, uh, and flourish in this, in this internet connected, you know, world we have. Um, but then I started thinking about some of the other Buddhist ideas or some of the other ways that Buddhism is practiced, uh, you know, around the world that might be not thriving, you know, like some of the ideas that are, are potentially falling away. I, you know, ideas, petition of like offering and merit, and uh, you mentioned ritual aspects as well. So I wanted to know um, if you could speak to that, whether whether you see um, see it somewhat, whether it's problematic that those are uh, you know maybe not as represented in a, in a digital age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, though that's a very good point. So um, obviously, in writing the book, I tried to focus on the elements of Buddhism that I saw reflected well on the internet, and I didn't talk that much about ones that haven't been. And you mentioned some of the uh, offering elements, uh, building merit, and many people have pointed out to me other ones, such as just well, what about just the key Buddhist idea of silent meditation? You know, mm -hmm. isn't that something that all the lights and, and videos and sounds that we get in modern media really distracts from? Right, and there's no doubt that in that sense. Um, so let me talk about the. I, I haven't really thought about the merit elements of it that much. Although, well, let, okay, let me say a little bit about merit first. So, the, the internet is remarkably good at eliciting, uh, eliciting uh, generous behavior from people. So, for example, uh, if you think of merit, one of the main ways that people build merit is through donations nowadays, right? Either to the monks or to needy people or whatever. But uh, that is a common way that people throughout Buddhist history have built up merit. And in terms of donations, maybe not specifically in the framework of Buddhism, right? And again, everything I'm talking about here is not necessarily in the framework of Buddhism, right? So that's why I called the book um, The Internet and the Evolution of Buddhist Ideas. I had originally called it And the Evolution of Buddhism, but then it was suggested to me that I should that I should focus more on the ideas because these ideas are general ideas that are, you know, instantiated in Buddhism quite closely, but they're present in many religions and many people are interested in them who really don't know all that much about Buddhism. So what I'm arguing is not that people are becoming Buddhist with that name on the internet, but that many ideas that Buddhism was trying to propagate are clicking in people's minds, whether they call it Buddhism or not, right? So on that score, um, generosity is alive and very well on the internet. So for example, in one of my classes that I teach, uh, all my classes aren't about Asian religions. I do a class about religion and, um, and world issues in which we have a section on social justice. And for one of the class projects, the students uh, choose somebody to sponsor on a website called Kiva. Has anybody heard of Kiva? It's a really great uh, site. It's a micro-loan agency where you can give $25 and people in developing countries apply for loans and they can use that $25 to buy a sewing machine, for example. And then you get paid back. So it's not a grant, it's a loan. Uh, anyway, so the idea is that the students divide into groups and each group chooses one person to sponsor and then we vote on who we want to sponsor and then we actually sponsor that person. Well, the last few years, the system works so well that 
when they chose the person in their group and then a few days later they presented to the class, by the time they presented it, that person was already fully funded. So then we had to go to the next person. They were already fully funded. So people are really good at using the internet to donate money to worthy causes. And whether they think of it in terms of building up merit for some sort of good thing that will happen to them in the future, I don't know. But certainly, uh, you know, Buddhism aside, the internet, while it does also cater to our most greedy instincts, <laughs> it also does promote remarkably generous uh, instincts in people. Uh, so I would say that in terms of the merit. Now, in terms of the meditation issue, and a lot of people... So those are the two things that are most commonly brought up, the uh, greed issue and the meditation issue. Uh, for meditation, I would say that, yes, computers and all the excitement that we have from digital media probably does distract people from time they would have otherwise had to meditate. I think that that is definitely true. I will point out that on Second Life, uh, one of my colleagues, Gregory Grieve is his name, he's also working on Buddhism and digital media. His work is really interesting as well. And uh, he did a survey of people on Second Life when their cartoon avatar is sitting and meditating. Are they sitting and meditating? <laughs> and actually, in over 50% of the people said that they actually sit and meditate while their avatar is meditating. <laughs> so in certain contexts, um, the internet can promote meditation. Certainly, I don't know about the internet, but apps are very good at promoting meditation. Many of these apps that I showed you uh, have actually showed quite, um, quite successful uh, results where people using the app, when it you know, rings and says, remember to meditate now, and you get points for meditating and stuff like that, they actually end up meditating more than they did you know, 20 years ago before all this stuff. So even in that case, it may be that it helps you meditate. And I would finally say, well, this might be controversial, but I'll say it anyway, is that even if uh, the internet prevents people from meditating, I would say that is meditation an end in itself? Or is meditation supposed to give you insights through the meditation? And if you can get the insights through other things, then you know, maybe in some sense uh, the meditation isn't as important. I mean, if you're, if you're using the internet and saying, oh my God, I've just realized that I don't have a permanent soul, right? <laughs> and that's what you're doing through meditating. You know, if you meditate less, that's a shame for the traditions of Buddhism. But if the end goal is the same, you know, if you can achieve Satori by using the internet, uh, then, I mean, I'm not saying that it's okay or not, but I'm just presenting it to your mind that maybe it's not such a big problem for me. Or just by you know, sweeping the floor, right? It's, exactly <laughs> yeah. right? it's well within the Buddhist tradition. That's right. It is well within the Buddhist tradition to achieve enlightenment and have deep Buddhist realizations doing things you know, other than meditating. So in this sense, that's just one more of those systems. You know, another aspect of um, your thesis that is just striking to me is just how optimistic it is about right. the use of the internet and about people's behavior on the internet. You started to mention a little bit about some of the bad behavior. So I'm just wondering, I mean, how does 4chan fit into, fit into this, uh, you know, a kind of a increasing global, you know, compassion and, and, and empathy, you know, when in some cases, we see the internet bringing out uh, maybe the worst behavior uh, mm -hmm. in, in, some, in some people or in some cases. Well, um, there are certainly a lot of elements of the internet that elicit the worst, most uncompassionate and greedy elements of humanity. There's no doubt about that. So no system is going to... Uh, be used only in positive ways, right? So all religions have negative and positive aspects to them. All media have negative and positive aspects to them. And there's no doubt that there are various websites and um, you know, discussion forums in which things get very ugly very quickly. And I fully acknowledge that. Um, but I'm simply saying that on balance, there's more of the good stuff than the bad stuff. But there's no doubt that there is stuff that is decidedly not Buddhist and is not going to make anybody come to any realizations that Buddhism had uh, on the internet. I will say that uh, 
you know, one hopes, I mean, this doesn't have anything to do with Buddhism necessarily, but since I also happen to be an advocate of the internet in general, just forgetting Buddhism, uh, one hopes that a lot of the sites where some of these really ugly things are going on takes away uh, the ugliness from actual society. Right? You know, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about, like, do violent video games make people more violent, or do they actually take away the violence because they get to uh, explore their violent tendencies on the video game instead of in the real world, right? So it's a similar kind of issue. If people are talking about, uh, you know, cruel things on 4chan, does that, is that an outlet that safely allows them to let off that steam and prevents them from doing those things in the real world. And that's something that we can't answer today. As you know, there's all sorts of surveys about these kinds of things, and sociologists are not in agreement about whether you know, violence and um, you know, all of the vices that we see on the internet helps to lessen it in society or strengthen it. What we do know is that, as a whole, there is far less violence in society now than there ever has been pretty much at any point in human history, right? Now, it seems like there's more because of the 24-hour news, uh, news cycle and they have to make money by getting eyeballs to see some uh, article about a shooting that happened somewhere, right? But if you look at the raw numbers, it is far, far less. And you might know about a book that came out a couple years ago by Steven Pinker. He's a psychologist at Harvard and he has a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And it's a 500-page examination of whether humans in the modern digital era are getting basically more violent or less violent. And he said that the, the raw data is clear, that we are a far less violent society than we've ever been at any time in human history. So whether that's because of the internet, I don't know, but it is, does seem to be the case. Uh, I, I did have an, uh, a question also about just your your study and how and how you actually conduct uh, your research because as you were mentioning uh, it took what eight years to write the book and mm -hmm. it seems like it, it's almost a lesson in impermanence right there because so much of the technology changes in that period of time I mean eight years is an eternity. Right, MySpace isn't even around really anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so many of my examples are MySpace and like what space? What's that? You know people don't even know what that is. So uh, are there any kind of new developments that uh, you, you haven't been able to you know, fully address yet that you're looking at, you know, things like maybe more like mobile technology, people being able to like constantly you know, record what they're eating in the real world mm -hmm. or things like that. Um, uh, do, you have, do you know what direction that you're going to go with that? Uh, there's a, yeah, it moves so quickly. Like I was saying before the talk started, that I don't really use the social media much myself. Even though I study it, I don't really use it all that much. There just isn't that much time in the day to do all the various things that one uh, can do. So I haven't had too much time to look into uh, some of the latest developments that are going on and how they apply to Buddhism. Since you asked, like I, I just a few days ago actually sent in a manuscript for the next book. It's an edited volume that I did, uh, and it's on Buddhism and digital humanities. So the thing that I'm researching now is not so much how Buddhist practitioners are using the internet to practice Buddhism or are learning about Buddhism through the internet and all this stuff. But now I've actually moved on to how scholars can use digital media to study Buddhism more effectively. So it's a kind of totally different thing, right? This is about how Buddhism in the world um, is, is, lives online. But now I'm saying, well, how can we use the internet and computers to study Buddhism as scholars? So this book is kind of aimed at scholars, and it looks at um, like natural language processing and how you can have computers go through this Buddhist canon, for example, and look for word patterns that nobody's noticed before and show that maybe this word is associated with that word, even though nobody ever realized that. So it's like pattern matching and stuff like that uh, that scholars would use to look at the... Uh, to, unpack the sacred texts in different ways that haven't been done before. So that's the kind of stuff I'm doing now. I've kind of moved on from this particular topic. It seems like that could have important implications for translation. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. There's a lot of um, new ways that we can translate and new insights we can get into how words have been used that haven't really been looked at before. You know, it's one of the things that you can only see it if you look at millions of examples, right? And then you see a pattern as a subtle one but it may be there. It may not. I haven't really done 
the research yet. This book is just the techniques to use. Then the next book will be, okay, now we're going to use the techniques. But first, we just wanted to get this book out there that told people a little bit about how to even do you know, language, uh, natural language processing and what programs are out there to do it and stuff like that. Great. So. Well, I want to open it up to the rest of the room to, oh, there's a lot of questions. Uh, I'll let you call on your. Oh, OK. I think <laughs> I saw your hand go up first. One thing you didn't mention was that Buddhism is quintessentially a religion of ideas. Right. I mean, there's more. As anybody who's ever taught a class on Buddhism knows, right, the very first thing that happens is a student comes up and says, hey, professor, it seems to me that Buddhism isn't really a religion, but is a philosophy, right? That's, and then we have to say, well, what's the difference between a religion and a philosophy? So certainly, it's, uh, most people understand that Buddhism is in some way connected to ideas as an abstract thing more than many other religions. Although, of course, there is a large tradition of practices associated with Buddhism. At least in theory, you can abstract it into a group of ideas better than other religions. And in that sense, ideas travel really well on the internet. And of course, the one thing that the internet really isn't good at yet, I might add, is anything that involves the physical body, right? Because that's the, so anything that can be abstracted into ideas is going to do much better than other things. Now, of course, there are 3D immersive, you know, with the helmet. Has any, have any of you tried the virtual reality with the helmets? It is pretty mind-blowing. Like, it really draws you in and makes you feel like you're there. So maybe even things involving the body in the future won't be, uh, the internet won't be an, an impediment to that. But right now, you're certainly right on that score. I wondered if um, any of these studies, the Pew study or your studies, uh, took into account the fact that uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of Buddhists in this country are immigrants from Asia, and uh, mo um, uh, and, and of course uh, mostly uh, mostly first generation, but, uh, uh, it, but though there there are exceptions to that, notably mm -hmm. in the Japanese American community. Yeah, that's a very. I'm glad you asked that, and I did think about that. And in one of the chapters, I go into great detail looking at the growth of Buddhism in the online community versus the growth of the Asian community in America and the percentage of the Asians that uh, are Buddhist. And even taking the rapid growth of the Asian community into account in America, it still is way uh, outpaced by the growth of Buddhism in general. So yeah, I definitely thought that maybe the vast and quick growth of Buddhism on the internet might be uh, a factor of the Asian community, but it's not that closely related. So I did, and the numbers are in, you know, are in the book somewhere. So yes, I did take that into consideration. But how many of the, uh, how many first generation a Asian immigrants are, uh, are, rep are uh, represented uh, as Buddhists on the internet? Um, well, certainly, I, did, I, mean, I didn't really take into consideration exactly how many of the Buddhists were also Asian, because they didn't say that on the internet. I mean, sometimes they did, but sometimes they didn't. But what I did look at was just general census uh, knowledge and also the general social survey that asked for people's backgrounds, and just looked at the growth of the Asian community in America versus the growth of the Buddhism community online. Remember, I showed that like the Second Life uh, Buddhist community grew two or three times over the course of five years, whereas the Christian one stayed the same and the Muslim one grew a little bit. And the growth of the Asian community is much less than that. So it's not, the growth of Buddhism is not closely connected, although of course there's a slight connection, but it's not, it's not accounted for by the growth of the Asian community. I think it is accounted for by the growth of the amount of people using the internet. So that's basically the theory, right? That the reason it grows so much is because more and more people are spending more and more time on the internet, and therefore the Buddhist ideas are resonating with them better, and they then endorse the ideas. Because you're right, if it was the case that the growth of Buddhism, as people spend more and more hours, I mean, we're talking like qu uh, quantitative studies here, right? As people spend more and more hours a day on the internet, over the years, and you see a growth in interest in Buddhism over the years, if it also was the case 
that the Asian community was growing at that same rate, that could have accounted for the growth of the people saying that they're Buddhist. But it's not the same rate, so it doesn't account for it. And I think that probably the internet accounts for it. Now, of course, anytime you say stuff like this, I do have to give the caveat that uh, just because you have correlations of different numbers, that doesn't necessarily imply a causality, right? So that also might be wrong, even though it's not connected to the Asians, it might also not be connected to the internet. But I think that it might be. I just, I just wanted to follow up on that. So uh, did you um, make any distinctions between the English-speaking internet and other, like, the internet as it manifests in different languages? Uh, I looked briefly at other languages, but for the sake of this thing, I just kept it to uh, America because once uh, that's the country that I know best, and it was in English and easiest to do. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I made sure to segregate out my data uh, to just people using the system in America. But that would be an interesting thing for sure, is to do a study of whether these trends are the same in other countries, in Europe or in, uh, you know, uh, Asia or whatever. Of course, Asia gets complicated because it's a base, many of the countries are base Buddhist societies, right? So it'd be a little harder to see it. But um, it certainly would be interesting to do that in the future, for sure. Uh, yes? <clears throat> so uh, one of the things the internet seems particularly good at is kind of stoking the, the fires of our desires and right. aversions. Right. And of course, in Buddhism, that's the, the source of <laughs> suffering. So I was just wondering if you kind of explored that thread at all in, in your book. Uh, in this book, I don't really explore it, but this is something that my, again, my colleague Gregory Grieve looks at. He's got, his book is called Cyber Zen, and it's looking at Zen meditation online. And he has a whole chapter about uh, the, uh, the way that the internet uh, increases desire. But I would say that, you know, the more desire is increased in somebody, and the more frustrated you are at achieving the desire, right? Because don't forget, the internet might really um, stimulate desires, but it also is not that great at fulfilling them because it's all virtual, it's just the screen, right? So it does, if anything, help people realize that the desires can't be properly satisfied. And in that sense, I mean, I don't talk about that element of it in the book, but I think that just because they do promote desires doesn't necessarily mean that that weakens uh, Buddhism because it might actually uh, increase it in that people then are not feeling satisfied and are looking for something to help them feel satisfied in life and realizing that conquering desires is going to be more satisfying is a possible answer that they might come across. But certainly it does uh, drive a lot of desires, there's no doubt about that. Well I'm thinking of one of the tendencies on the internet which is called the echo chambers tendency right. which is for people to form new identities uh, that are more geographically spread out uh, and just replace the old ones which are more geographically local and my own thought in this is well these new identities um, can also uh, undermine the, the belief in absolute reality, which is a Buddhist idea, but it can be in the negative sense of, well, everything's just an opinion. And mm -hmm. so you then lose a community of where people actually discuss what's real. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so there's two sides to every coin, right? And I certainly am going to agree that there's a lot of these features that can be used in positive ways or negative ways, or in Buddhist ways and non-Buddhist ways. And um, there's no doubt that that goes on. And of course, some people will settle into uh, one way of looking at it and approaching it, and other people settle into another way. So I'm certainly, you know, there's a big mistake that I found, and I, I talk about this a, a little bit in the book, that in general, with uh, academic studies of history or social trends or whatever, people tend to be like talking absolutes, like, well, this is always going to be the case and it's always going to lead to that. And then people bring up, well, it can sometimes lead to this. And you have to look at everything st statistically, basically, right? So all I'm saying is that it tends to lead to this, but it doesn't mean that it has to. In fact, there's a famous incidence of this in media studies and India um, because one of the great sociologists, uh, Jack Goody, who actually came up with uh, some of the early ideas about um, writing and uh, about writing and various stages of civilization. He said that you can't have certain kinds of scientific thought without writing. 
and that every society that has these elements of their thought has to have writing. And sure enough, ancient India had those scientific elements but didn't have writing. So how do you explain that? So then he said, well, they must have had writing, but we just haven't found it. And you know, there were all sorts of excavations launched to try to find traces of writing and stuff, and millions of dollars spent, and they never found any. And it's now understood that they didn't have writing. I'm thinking in particular of, uh, well, Patanjali is the great uh, grammarian, I'm sorry, not Patanjali, Panini is the great grammarian from ancient India who codified the Sanskrit language. And his Ashtadhyayi, which is the 4,000 verses that perfectly encapsulates the Sanskrit language, is the most scientific study of any language that's ever been done. In fact, many modern grammars are based on it. So Goody was saying that there is no way that such an advanced work could possibly have been developed without writing. And everybody agreed with him, and they didn't find it. So he should have just said, usually, you need writing. It would have solved all these problems, right? No historical trends are absolute, right? So he could have said, in nine out of 10 times, they'll have writing. But it's possible that they don't. But he didn't. He said, you have to. And, they, and this always happens, right? There's always some theory. And they shoot themselves in the foot because they phrase the theory in terms of, this always has to happen if you're going to have that. But if you had just said, this usually happens if you're going to have that, then you're safe, right? I mean, you, so. Um, OK, so um, thank you very much. I, I have a couple of questions. And I think I'd like to ask the first one and get your response. And then the second one is on a completely different topic. Um, so the first one is. is um, I mean, it's easy enough to say, well, but what about this? There's always going to be somebody who comes along and says, yeah, you know, you say this, but what about this? And I guess that's kind of what I'm going to do. But, but um, it's also that, that I think there is a quality in, in the internet that is really worth exploring that seems to me to cut in the opposite direction from what you're saying. And the example I'm thinking of is, has to do with the presentation of self. So, so you know, You've talked about how the self perhaps gets undermined in some ways through being on the internet. Um, but it does seem as though people spend a lot of time cultivating a certain self-image and then putting that out there in the world. You know, I read something the other day, I think it was in an Asian country, I don't remember which one, that said that when somebody posts a picture of themselves uh, on, on, I don't know, Instagram, I guess, um, that on average it takes them half an hour to get that picture ready because they're, they're refining it, they're right. shaping it, they're changing right. it. Right. Um, so in some ways it seems like you're really um, emphasizing the sense of this is who I am yep. because this is how I want to present myself. Right. I agree. But, but that last word that you said, how I want to present myself, it does promote the idea of myself being important, but it also makes somebody realize that they can be different things if they present themselves different ways, right? So this is, I mean, as I said, Buddhism also talks about personal responsibility as well as weakening the sense of the ego. So in a sense, you, want to, you have to hit a delicate balance between a sense of myself and a sense in which the ego is, you know, there is no self. So for example, before Buddhism, when uh, people in ancient tribal times lived as a community, and you didn't really have the idea of the individual self, you know, as a philosophical entity. There weren't religions that talked about the dissolution of the self into the undifferentiated void and whatever the various mystical traditions say, both Buddhism and Sufism and the other ones. They didn't have those ideas in ancient times uh, until this period because they didn't have the idea of the self to take apart, right? And in fact, if you look at tribal societies in relatively modern times, right? So um, when anthropologists go and look at the various religions of Africa or North America and whatnot uh, in relatively recent times, you don't find mystical traditions in those religions in which you're trying to dissolve the self into an undifferentiated divine godhead, right? That mystical idea is only found, oh, is almost always <laughs> only found in civilizations in which they also have a well-defined idea of the self, because you then have to take it apart, right? So uh, 
maybe that's you know, similar to the, what you find on the internet, that you have on one hand a building up of the self, and on the other hand a taking apart. And since you're doing the building up of the self, right, because you're taking the picture and you're posing, that might make you think that the self is not a given, that this is just what I am, but this is something that I can make and change. And that might, you know, be an opening to the Buddhist ideas about it. Okay, I see that. Um, the, the, um, the second thing is maybe more of an aside, uh, but I'll go ahead and bring it up now. It has to do with this other book you mentioned that you're working on about um, the digital humanities, Buddhism mm -hmm. and the uh, digital humanities and the study of Buddhism. That happens to be something that we think about a lot here at Mongolian Research Center, and we've actually had a couple of grants from the NEH on, on um, digital humanities in Buddhism. And I just wanted to mention, and you, I'm sure you're well aware of this, that, that um, it's not easy to work with the kinds of digital humanities research that's going on because the corpus of text is so small. Um, mm -hmm. the, the idea of, of you know, big data, basically, which oh, is right. what you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, you just don't have enough text to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's a real consideration. It's something we struggle with in, in the work that we do. Right, like if you're looking for patterns where you really need millions of examples to see the pattern emerge, there just isn't enough words in the text. Certainly. Now, Buddhism has an advantage in that, although it's not really big, true big data, it still is a larger corpus than mo almost any other religion. So on that score, you're doing better to do it with Buddhism than others. But you're right, it's not quite big enough to see the pattern. So you've got to adjust the algorithms a little bit and make them work for the kind of text that you're, that you're looking at. But that's a good point. So thank you very much. It was really fascinating. I work on East Asia. And I don't know if uh, internet there makes people be better Buddhists, but I can tell you they really use it a lot. Yes. They have apps uh, for everything, for rituals, for meditation. They, there is a, an app where you have a small uh, monk giving you uh, answering your questions and giving you religious advices. There is an app also for transferring of merits in China. So it is used a lot, and so thank you so much. My question actually is on the premises of all your talk. And uh, um, it might be a strange question I'm asking, but uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, some of the elements that you have uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, interdependent, uh, interconnection uh, versus interdependence or impermanence, and the second life example is really evident about that. So these do, um, do function. I, I agree with you. But some other uh, elements, uh, they make sense, but they, they could also be referred to another very universalistic uh, religion, such as Christianity. I'm speaking about the network, missionary mm -hmm. networks. I'm speaking about the fact that they cut, uh, uh, they just tried to uh, make a cut with the traditional rituals, but then they reintroduced important rituals, and the ritual is so important in Christianity as it is in Buddhism nowadays. So what they did was just to, to make a, a distinction between themselves and, what, and who were there before, so Judaism in the case of Christianity. Or what else? Uh, universal moral code. Uh, we, well, we have also compassion and so on. So I was just wondering if in your book you also consider the fact that in many cases Christianity would also go. Mm -hmm. Then I have to admit Christianity doesn't uh, work so well as Buddhist. So I, I'm convinced of, uh, uh, from your thesis but still I see these, uh, mm -hmm. these points. Thank you. Well um, I talk a little bit about Christianity and I certainly um, mention it briefly, and I discuss exactly some of these issues, because you're certainly right. As I said, that these features are not exclusive to Buddhism. Some of them are, and some of them aren't. And some of them are seen in Christianity. 
I think that more of them are seen in Islam. So if you don't mind, I will answer your question by talking about Islam because that I have a whole chapter about in the book. Uh, well, half a chapter, but not Christianity so much. So in, if you look at the Silk Road, right, what religion is found in the areas where the Silk Road used to be now? It's basically 95% Muslim. So in the book, I do talk a little bit about Islam and Buddhism and what happened on the Silk Road. If, you know, so forgetting the internet for a minute, if we look at the Silk Road, we have the similar features, right? Because you've got a dialogue, you've got, uh, you're, you're learning about other cultures so you can have compassion for people because you're meeting them in the marketplaces in Kashgar or wherever. So if you look at the kind of Islam that displaced Buddhism, and this is where I say Buddhist ideas and not Buddhism, it, it was the more liberal Sufi Islam that first got, gained inroads in Central Asia that brought Islam there, right? So when Islam displaced Buddhism, it was largely Sufi saints who were wandering around, not talking about these strict laws that we associate with Wahhabi Islam nowadays, but rather about universal love, about, uh, the, about um, you know, fana, which is the annihilation of the individual soul into the love of God and things like that. So there were many features, and also it was much less ritualistic than many other religions, um, and antinomian in various ways. So there were a lot of features that were common to uh, Sufi Islam that were very similar to Buddhism. So I argue that Sufi Islam kind of caught on there because there were similar elements in it that one finds in Buddhism. And there's an amazing book called uh, Buddhism and Islam on the Silk Road by Johann, Johann Elverskog, and he talks about the idea that even the Muslims in those days recognized that Sufi Islam was very similar to Buddhism. And there was even some questions as to whether the Dharma is a kind of you know, mystical Islam and stuff like that. Then, as the Silk Road closed down, when it was replaced by the sea route, so in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, that's when you start to see the Sufi forms of Islam fading away and the stricter forms of Islam that are less kind of open-minded taking hold there. So it's exactly when the communication stops being used and the Silk Road stops being a place where all sorts of people from different ideas, uh, with different ideas are traversing, that less, uh, you know, that uh, more stricter forms of Islam start to, start to settle in there. So uh, that's just one example of how I kind of look at the effects of other religions and compare it to Buddhism and things like that. Now, I will also say that the second fastest growing religion on the internet is Islam. So all of the studies I did show that in terms of like the amount of time, like if you look at correlation between how many hours a day people in surveys say they st spend on the internet and what religions they are most interested in, it's highest with Buddhism. But number two across the board was Islam. So today also Islam... Uh, I guess, appeals to many of these universalistic ideas as Buddhism does. Yes? Yeah, I'm wondering um, the fact that Buddhism uh, is so much more prevalent among users in the internet, is that because they're Buddhists or is that because they're um, educated, internet savvy, global? And uh, it has nothing to do with Buddhism, it just reflects their education. Right. Uh, when, I, when I did the research about the, if there's a connection between the Asian population and its growth in America and Buddhism, I also looked into this question as to whether it simply is the case that internet users who are educated, uh, you know, people of a certain group uh, in, in America are also the people who are interested in Buddhism. And that was the case at the very beginning, right? But um, since then, there's actually been not much correlation between that. So I definitely looked at that. And again, if you're interested, the numbers are all in the book. I don't have them on the top of my head. But I, do, I go through the various, um, the connection between salary and internet use per day and education level and internet use per day, and then how many people claim that they're interested in Buddhism versus other things. And the correlation is uh, not there. I thought it might be too, and that the whole thesis wouldn't, you know, there was just an artifact of, you know, a certain group being on the internet uh, and a certain group being interested in Buddhism. But that connection is not actually there. So it's a good question, 
but doesn't seem to account for it. Yes. I have visited two Buddhist centers in California. Uh, one is Wat Budano Son. It's from Thailand. Right. It's right here in Fremont. Have you been there? No. But okay. I've heard of it. Yeah. Most of the community that attends it are Thai. The right. discourses right. are in Thai language. Okay. But at the back of the temple, Buddhist temple, is uh, a shrine of Guanyin. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are four faces of Buddha. Buddha facing in four directions. One is metta, loving kindness. Other is karuna, which is compassion, which we've, you have talked about. Mm -hmm. Third is mudita, sympathetic joy. And fourth is upekha, equanimity, equality, tra treating everybody equally. Right. Okay? A child, an old man, a young man, female. You treat all life as sacredness. Okay? Right. Same pattern I saw at a uh, Sri Lankan temple in Sacramento, West Sacramento. The Buddhist priest teaches at IBS here in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a class from him called Buddhist Ethics. Mm -hmm. Okay, But he has a temple, and mostly it's a Sri Lankan community in West Sacramento. We've got the same pattern. We have Guan Yin there, and we have Buddha in four directions. Right. And I'm wondering, What's the connection here between Guanyin tradition and Buddhist tradition? Hmm. Well, um, certainly, I've noticed this in Thailand too, that in the last few decades, Chinese bodhisattvas like Guanyin have been incorporated into Theravada uh, iconography. And that, I mean, I guess it used to be the case a long time ago, you know, where you had uh, Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism existing together in Southeast Asia, and there's lots of archaeological finds in which you find statues of Avalokiteshvara, who is the Indian version of Guan Yin, uh, in Sri Lanka and Thailand and places like that. Then, you know, various kings, for various reasons, tried to suppress those forms of Buddhism and so-called purify it into Theravada. But now, in the modern era, probably because of mass... I mean, it's the same thing that might be the same phenomenon that one sees in modern life in general, where you have people mixing things that didn't used to be mixed, right? Like when I was a kid, I was big into music. And, you know, you either listen to, you know, punk or classic rock or heavy metal, and you would never mix. Like, you would never listen to, uh, you know, a punk band and a progressive rock band. They were like opposites. But nowadays, uh, people listen to everything, and they'll have albums in their collection that you would never have found in somebody's house when I was a kid. And uh, that's happening with religion too, probably, where things that were used to be viewed as different are now just being viewed as acceptable, largely because so many people are trading pictures and music and, I guess, Buddhist texts on the internet, you know, sending each other, oh, read this, read that, and they get involved in other traditions that are beyond the narrow one that they might have grown up in. So it might very well be related to modern media, why we're finding Chinese guanyins in Thai Theravada temples nowadays. Thank you. The front cover of your book has a Thai monk uh, in front of a telephone sh uh, right. uh, internet shop. I don't know if you know Thailand, but the MBK Mao is a four-story high-tech Mao. Uh -huh. And it's really, really striking that you see so many Buddhist monks in there. It's like much higher than you see anywhere else apart right. from the temple. Do you think there's any reason for that? Because it's the other side now. You know, bhikkhus really are interested in high-tech. Yes. And I think you can genuinely say that. Mm -hmm. And it, I wonder why. And I'm interested in... Yeah, I know. That is a good point. I haven't really researched that or thought about that particular element too strongly, but you're absolutely right, that they certainly are very into high-tech. And maybe it's because, I mean, the Buddha said time and again, spread my word, spread my word, right? And he said it explicitly. So they say, well, this is a way to spread the word. And uh, I mean, the Buddhist monkhood has since day one been an international organization meeting, uh, you know, they would have uh, you know, the various uh, congresses of the monks who had gathered together at different places over the years. And these were some of the first international conferences that ever happened in the world, right? Where people would get together for a singular purpose from different countries and they would sail in from Burma and Thailand and meet and discuss things, then go back to their countries and tell them. So the internet is just a great way to do that virtually. And I think monks 
kind of, it's just been in the blood of the Sangha from day one to use anything and everything they can to get the word out and to talk to their friends. <laughs> Well, unless there's any more questions, I think that concludes the evening. So thank you so much for joining us today and your wonderful insights. And let's give them a round. Okay. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, everybody. And I do have a few books there if anybody's interested. But. <laughs>